Sam Chand and the Larry and Clara Silverstein Chair uh, in Real Estate Development and Investment at the Shack Institute of Real Estate. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for our spring 2021 Ackman Lecture in Real Estate Ethics and Leadership. Uh, the series was established and, and our ethics program uh, is funded uh, through a gift from uh, Larry Ackman, who has been a great friend of the Shack Institute uh, for, for many, many years. Uh, this uh, particular speaker series uh, is a special one for us. Uh, once a year, sometimes twice a year, uh, depending on the circumstances, we invite, uh, you know, as we always do, an extraordinary leader in, in industry, uh, but uh, someone who, uh, in particular, really exemplifies our goal and goals and mandate at the Shack Institute uh, to do good while doing well. Um, our recent speakers uh, over the last several years have included Tammy Jones, uh, the CEO of Basis Investment Group um, and the chair of uh, the Real Estate Executive Council, the preeminent organization uh, of Black and uh, Latinx uh, professionals in the real estate industry, uh, Kirk Sykes, the former chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, uh, who's dedicated much of his career to investing in, in urban and underserved communities. Uh, Craig Robinson, a, a member of our board, formerly uh, of WeWork, uh, and Quinton Primo, uh, the uh, chairman of uh, Capri uh, Capital Partners um, and, and the founder of the Primo Center for Women and Children. Um, so delighted. Uh, that uh, we are joined today uh, by Ann McCullough. Um, and uh, not only and because of the work that you've done, but because of how relevant it is uh, today. So much of the conversation uh, that we've had in the policy dialogue that we've engaged in at Shack and elsewhere over the last year is focused on uh, issues around how it is that you know, during a period of extraordinary stress, particularly for income constrained families, we would continue to ensure that everyone had access to housing opportunity. Um, and all of the amenities uh, that are associated with those opportunities, whether it be good quality public schools uh, or access to the public transportation infrastructure that ultimately is key to giving people access to jobs. Um, I'm going to let you take it from here. Folks, I'm gonna come back at around uh, 15 minutes to uh, the hour uh, where uh, I will share some of your questions with Anne. Please do uh, take advantage of uh, the Q&A. So I think at this point, everyone knows how to uh, use Zoom. Uh, drop your questions in the Q&A. You can also upvote uh, the, the questions that you like. So click on the like if you see a question that you think is particularly relevant uh, and it will rise uh, to the top. For uh, all of you folks who are uh, participating via our Facebook Live or our YouTube live streams, please jump on over uh, to Zoom, uh, because uh, if you do that, uh, you'll actually be able to, to, to pose some questions. One last plug, we have two great events next week, our final events of, of the academic year, um, in which we've had almost 200 uh, different programs and events for our students and our friends in industry. Uh, one focused on, uh, the uh, uh, this is with a question mark, a Green New Deal for New York City. Uh, that will be on the 4th uh, in the morning. And then in the, after, in the evening uh, next Tuesday, again, a program that we're really, really proud of. And I know that many of you were able to attend um, our Emerging Women Leaders uh, event uh, last week, which was our first ever event that was organized entirely by and for young women professionals uh, in real estate. It was really an extraordinary program and I'm really proud of that. We'll have those videos up later today uh, and tomorrow if you wanna watch the replays. We have our third annual Pride Roundtable uh, next Tuesday evening. And that's an opportunity for LGBTQ students and professionals from all around the country. It's mission driven for us. We don't care where you go to school, please join us uh, to, to build your network and to meet other LGBTQ uh, professionals and allies. Uh, more information about that. Uh, while Anne is chatting, I'll be dropping a couple of links with her bio, some information about uh, HPET uh, in, into the chat. Uh, don't let that distract you though. Anne, thank you so much for joining us uh, once again. Let me pass it over to you. Thank you, Sam. And thanks to all of you for joining us. Um, I should probably start with a warning. I'm a Hauser and I've spent 40 years applying different tools to address the challenges of affordable housing. As a result, I'm way more interested in housing research than a normal person should be. Uh, and second, I'm a lawyer and I come from generations of progressive Southern lawyers and ministers and teachers. And we tell stories to make sense of the world around us. So I'll share facts, I'll share research from the sources I rely on. And I'll also try to put all of that in the context of the work that I'm doing uh, and the context of our communities. 
I'm the CEO of an equity REIT that really invests to create social equity. How do we do that? We partner with some of the best in class nonprofit affordable housing providers, names you know, uh, Mercy Housing out of Denver, Hispanic Housing out of Chicago, Eden Housing out of San Francisco. And together we acquire and maintain the affordability of rental apartment communities that serve families of modest means. We know our approach changes lives and we know our approach strengthens communities. But how do we know? Well, let me tell you about the people that we serve. We serve essential workers, people we need in our communities, people we all rely on. Who did you miss during the pandemic? The retired teacher who used to come to your house to tutor your son in AP chemistry? The regulars, the staff and customers at the Corner Cafe? The staff at the Seniors Exercise Program that your mother-in-law used to take the County Parks and Recreation Center? the guys at the local hardware store who could help you figure out how to fix anything. We miss them. Who were you grateful to during the pandemic? The nurses, the lab techs, the orderlies who kept the hospitals and doctor's offices and health clinics going, the delivery drivers who delivered all those things that we used to go out for so that we could stay home and be safe the home health care aides who kept coming to take care of your dad, even before there were good masks or vaccines. And the teachers who figured out how to juggle in-person and remote teaching on an odd and off schedule. Uh, and frankly, for me, the folks at the bagel shop who figured out the new logistics of interrupted supply chains, varying staff needs, and outdoor pickup windows. And in case of a natural disaster, who do you need first? Emergency workers, healthcare workers, firefighters, public safety officers, transportation workers, food and grocery workers, construction workers. These are the residents that Housing Partnership Equity Trust serves because we know that if we're gonna have a vital community that delivers the things we all want, we need housing that meets the needs of all these essential workers. But why focus on housing instead of jobs or healthcare or education? Because housing is economic destiny. And uh, one of the people in the, the chat wanted to know if I've got a written presentation or a PowerPoint. Mm -mm. It's just me talking. Uh, so uh, the, the, hope it works. Um, when you think about housing as economic destiny though, your home and your neighborhood play a critical role for every member of your household. Um, in Chicago, average life expectancy for those who are born at the same time but in different neighborhoods can differ by as much as 30 years. Poor quality housing is directly tied to childhood emotional and behavioral problems and early developmental delays. Housing indoor air quality is responsible for up to 40% of children's asthma episodes. And research indicates that moving an asthmatic child from bad housing into healthier housing reduces asthma-related doctor's visits by as much as 66%. And we know that growing up in high crime, poor communities can impact earning potential. In 2015, researchers at Harvard looked at income data and more than 5 million children whose families moved across counties between 1996 and 2012 and found that low-income boys who stayed in high crime, poor neighborhoods made about 35% less on average than low-income children who grew up in the best areas for mobility. Such moves also produce significant health benefits for poor parents including lowering the prevalence of the conditions that have contributed to the higher COVID pandemic death rates among minorities, such as diabetes and obesity. So housing matters to individuals and families and to our overall economic health. But we have a shortage, a serious shortage of housing overall and particularly of affordable housing. And as a result, we have an affordability crisis that started well before COVID-19, but has accelerated all the way through the pandemic. You're in the housing business, so you know the data. Households are cost burdened when they pay more than 30% of their income for rent or mortgage and utilities. And they're severely cost burdened when they pay more than 50%. For households making 30% of very median income, 
we only have 37 available and affordable homes for every 100 households. At 50% of the area median income, we have 60 available and affordable homes for 100 households. At 80% of AMI, we have 94 homes per 100 households. So households are forced into the worst game of musical chairs in an effort to have security and stability with the losers in this really brutal game paying more, sometimes much more than they can afford. And homeowners aren't exempt from that affordability challenge. In 2019, before the pandemic, about 30% of all households paid more than 30% of their income on housing. With the job and work hour losses from the pandemic, the number of cost burden households has skyrocketed. We also know that issues of racial equity are involved. A higher percentage of black and brown households rent. A higher percentage of black and brown household renters are cost burdened. And a higher percentage of black and brown renters suffered income losses during the pandemic. While 42% of all white renters are cost burdened, 52% of Latinx renters and 54% of black renters are cost burdened. Over 30% of black renters spend more than half their income on housing. And that just isn't right. As the pandemic took hold in April of 2020, Freddie Mac surveyed consumers to see where they were on housing issues and found that 66% of renters had made spending changes or had moved so they could afford their monthly housing payment. Half of all renters were finding it difficult to find affordable housing close to work. Households who pay too much for rent don't have the funds to cover the basic necessities, much less to thrive. So let's look at a family of four with two full-time working adults making minimum wage. You know, even before we get started, the numbers aren't going to work out, right? A full-time job at the federal minimum wage yields $1,256 in monthly gross wages. Then let's assume a few deductions for local, state, and federal taxes and a little hourly instability in working hours to get to a net monthly income for two working adults of about $2,008 a month. An average two bedroom apartment at fair market rents costs $1,246 a month, though good luck finding that place. And I don't know what you're paying for groceries, but the Department of Agriculture's thrifty food budget for a family of four, two adults and two school age children is $671 a month. When you deduct for rent and food, this working family only has $91 a month left for transportation, childcare, and all the other necessities for four people. Really, it just doesn't add up. So let's look at the problem the other way. What do you actually need in order to be able to afford a modest place to live? The National Low Income Housing Coalition says you need to make about just under $20 an hour, more than twice the federal minimum wage to afford a one bedroom or $23.96 an hour to afford a two bedroom apartment. 12 of the 20 largest occupations in the country, including home health care aides, janitors, food servers, those occupations provide a median wage that's lower than what's needed for a full-time worker to be able to afford modest rental housing. The job sectors that lost the most jobs and have yet to recover because of the pandemic were the sectors that rely on us gathering together closely. For example, according to Fannie Mae, at the end of January, there were still an estimated 23% fewer jobs in leisure and hospitality than there were at the start of 2020, representing 3.8 million lost jobs in this sector alone. More importantly, these are the workers who are more likely to rent. As recently as 2018, an estimated 57% of workers in leisure and hospitality were renters. So to state the obvious, incomes have a big effect on affordability. Prior to the pandemic, the National Multi-Housing Council research showed that falling incomes for lower income households and stagnant incomes for middle income households were a critical factor in increasing affordability challenges. Since 2000, real household incomes have fallen for the bottom 40% of American households, while the middle 20% have experienced almost no real household income growth. 
median renter household income declined more than 5% between 2000 and 2016. We don't have the stats for 2020 and into 2021, but it's not been pretty. New research by Freddie Mac shows that last year, more than half of surveyed renters really were afraid that they wouldn't be able to pay their rent. And 27% of surveyed homeowners and 35% of renters had asked for a housing payment postponement. In 2019, fewer than 2% of all renter households were threatened with eviction within the previous three months. While in January of this year, even with the federal eviction moratorium in place, almost 10% of renters reported they were behind on rent or were afraid that they'd be evicted in the next two months. And the inability to pay rent has affected every apartment class. RealPage Analytics has reported that rent payments across asset classes, A, B, and C, were down approximately 3% uh, in 2020 from 2019. And estimates of back due rent range from 1740 per household to si over 6,000 per household as of January, 2021. And frankly, the bleeding hadn't stopped, right? Uh, and the numbers depend on whether you look at all the households who've been struggling over the last year, including households who are struggling before the pandemic, that's the lower number, or the higher numbers, just those households who lost their jobs because of the pandemic. The eviction moratoria and prohibitions on late fees have had an impact in keeping residents housed with the stimulus payments directly to households, unemployment insurance, and new federal, state, and local short-term rental assistance having a significant impact and lim limiting the ballooning back due rent. But it's certainly not been enough. And it's not just income. Uh, we have an overall crisis in supply that's been building for decades. Freddie Mac estimated that in uh, 2018, the U.S. had about 2.5 million fewer homes than we needed to meet long-term demand. Research by the National Multi Housing Council found in 2019 that on average, the country needs to produce about 328,000 units of apartment housing every year to, get, to be where we need to be for demand. And that didn't happen. In the last 30 years, we've produced 330,000 units in a single year three times. Doesn't happen. Uh, between 2000 and 2016, we added 3.2 million rental apartment units, affordable to moderate income households, making 75,000 or less, while twice that many new net new moderate income households entered the rental market. Again, the numbers don't add up. One key factor in the affordable housing crisis overall has been the loss of existing affordable housing. And that's really where I focus. But let's start with single family homes. If you live in the suburbs, how many of the modest three bedroom ramblers in your neighborhood that could house a county government official and his family or a family with a dad with a good union blue collar job have been replaced with three and four story, five bedroom homes that are priced for law firm partners and REIT CEOs. In my neighborhood, that's about 90%. When we look at the apartment supply, about half the rental apartment stock was built before 1980. And in any given year, between 120,000 and 240,000 units of affordable rental housing are lost to the affordable housing inventory either by being rehabbed and brought way up the income scale to serve higher income residents or through decay and demolition. Another key driver has been the long-term decline in the construction of entry level uh, single family homes and unrestricted lower cost rental apartments. Apartment construction has been almost exclusively in the bar belt. High cost, higher amenity properties for renters making uh, who have the income to pay a rent that can support high development costs. And at the other end, occupancy restricted, rent restricted, deeply subsidized properties for renters making 60% of very median income or much less. Units targeted to moderate income renters, those making 50 to 80% of very median income, like the renters my REIT serves, are rarely financially feasible to build because it costs much more to build those units than moderate income renters can afford to pay. 
In the late 1970s, nearly half a million new entry-level homes were being built per year. That number has declined every decade so that by 2020, Freddie Mac estimates that only 65,000 new entry-level homes were completed. Half a million down to 65,000. At the same time, over 2 million households bought their first home in 2020, despite all the economic uncertainty. Not every first time home buyer wants a so-called starter home, but the large gap between the type of available housing and the demand puts pressure up and down the income chain. Simply put, renters can't buy houses that don't exist, creating more pressure on rental affordability. And of course, larger demographics have also had an impact. Uh, you all saw all the headlines this week on population growth, really reminding us that population growth doesn't spread evenly across the country. Between 2017 and 2019, the South and the West grew seven times faster than the Northeast and the Midwest, and the pandemic has accelerated this trend. In the South, population growth was mainly driven by domestic migration, while in the West before the pandemic, growth was mostly driven by natural increase, more births than deaths. Before the pandemic, a majority of metros experienced more growth in the suburbs than in the cities. And uh, population in some of the smaller and medium-sized cities was certainly growing much faster in percent terms than in the larger metros. And both these trends accelerated dramatically through the pandemic. As a matter of fact, over the past 10 years, the top three MSAs with the fastest growth are the villages in Florida, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, and Austin, Texas. Now, the top 10 fastest growing metros before the pandemic, only the Washington DC area grew more because of natural increase than because of net migration. So why do we care? Because if your town is growing or has been growing because people are moving there, then you need to think about what happens when they stop. Because people quit moving when there's no place to move to. And as a result, employers struggle to, attain, to attract the talent they need. They struggle to retain the talent. And businesses are challenged. Community vitality and resilience is constrained. In the DC area, like a lot of other metros, housing growth simply hasn't kept pace with the employment base. Uh, the DC area is forecast to add about 400,000 new jobs to its employment base between 2020 and 2030, but just over half that many new homes. Using standard metrics for balancing jobs and houses, we know that we need to add about 75,000 additional new homes in addition to the housing that was already uh, projected to be delivered just in order to keep pace. And as a result of this shortfall every day or before the pandemic, not today, uh, more than 325,000 workers were commuting to jobs in DC from outside the region. The, uh, Result is that there's been a real affordability challenge we, that potentially undercuts the area's attractiveness to new companies and talent, certainly strains the transportation system, it impacts the environment and quality of life for the region's residents, and many people have long commutes to work and difficult choices between paying for rent or other affordable uh, necessities. And really an even bigger commute commitment is I think we're going to see to ongoing remote working won't take enough pressure off this gap to fill the housing need. While the pandemic has increased moves to suburbs and smaller cities, it's also caused a slow down in household formation as people who ordinarily would have moved into their own homes were unable or unwilling to do during the pandemic. The demographic with the greatest number of missing households during the pandemic or white 25 to 29 year olds. While the group that saw the greatest decline since 2006 in forming new households were African American 25 to 29 year olds. As the economy recovers, household formation is expected to resume. By 2025, there could be 6.4 million more households, because all those people who didn't move out from their parents or their roommates may begin to set up their own households particularly the millennials who are aging into their later 30s, if they can find a place they can afford to live. But how can we build more housing? 
And there's not one magic solution. We need local, regional, and national efforts by the public and private sector. There are four things really that limit supply, labor, cost of materials, cost of land, which is largely tied to the fourth thing, our rules for building or not building in our communities. And of those four things, our rules are the thing that all of us in this virtual room can have an impact on through engagement with our elected officials. State, local, and neighborhood barriers add to the cost of development and for apartment properties, those increased costs are a critical factor in creating the barbell effect I discussed a minute ago. Zoning policies, land use regulations, permitting processes, all add to lay an additional cost to new development and delay costs money. In our largest cities, the time from when a developer starts thinking about a new apartment project to when the first tenants can move in can be 10 years. Think about that household full of children can come of age while waiting for that new apartment. According to research by ULI, apartment developers estimate that a two-year approval process can add two to two and a half million dollars in costs, even before fees and developer contributions, regardless of whether a project has 60 units or 600 units. And these costs have to be covered by rent or by subsidies. So we need to look long and hard at whether we collectively believe that the good things that our requirements and regulations are theoretically designed to achieve can offset the terrible costs that they're cumulatively imposing on American households. And of course, we have to be mindful of the other factors, the cost of construction, materials and labor grew 57% from 2000 to 2016, and they've continued to climb. And last year saw a record high in lumber prices land costs doubled from 2000 to 2019. And talking about supply, I haven't even begun to talk about the impact of climate, but it looms large in any discussion of our built environment. In the first eight months of 2019, the U of 2020, the US experienced 16 distinct billion dollar natural disasters, making last year one of the three worst on record and climate change has added to the number of low-income households facing energy and housing insecurity as record heat waves and cold spells have driven energy usage sky high. I'm sure all of us watched in horror as record coal overwhelmed the capacity of the Texas power grid to meet life and death needs for electricity and heat. So as we focus on supply, we also have to focus on making our buildings more climate resilient and finding ways to reduce energy and natural resource consumption. And of course, everybody's talking about infrastructure, right? And when you think about infrastructure, what first comes to mind are crumbling bridges, crumbling roadways and sewers. But the nation's supply of housing represents a significant share of investments made in physical infrastructure. In 2020, total capital investment in housing was estimated at 36.2 trillion, comprising nearly 140 million homes. Housing is also a vital component of our GDP, contributing nearly a fifth of our nation's GDP. The Biden administration's recent American Jobs Plan represents a historic acknowledgement that housing is a critical part of our nation's infrastructure, and it proposes a 213 billion uh, funding for housing, the biggest promised outlay in affordable housing supply since the Great Depression. We need that money. But if we get this money, how should we invest it in uh, our other housing dollars? The Aspen Institute actually has recommended a five-part approach uh, to taking on the housing challenges that apply in this, to this money too. First, we need to affirmatively address racial and ethnic inequality and other forms of discrimination in housing and promote neighborhood integration. We need to make it easier to build all types of housing. We need to preserve the availability and affordability of lower cost private market housing and subsidized affordable housing. And we need to support households directly to close the gap between their resources and the cost of securing and maintaining affordable housing. We also have to support renters' well-being and access to resources to resolve housing challenges. But increasing funding alone won't solve the problem. 
As the Turner Center has noted, we need to reform our existing housing programs and rethink how we deliver housing assistance directly to families and change the broader landscape of housing. We have an opportunity today to align our infrastructure investment with broader housing policy reforms to have a larger impact and to create a more equitable future. So we shouldn't waste this opportunity. So what reforms are needed first? First, we need to rethink how we get more housing built, including what types of housing we build and where. So really this is about regulatory reform. Second, we need to directly support households in affordable housing. One in four households who are eligible for housing choice vouchers actually receive them. And among those who receive them, many can't find a place to spend them. So we need to fill that gap. And then third, and perhaps most importantly, we need to change our zoning practices. Today's housing landscape is the direct result of the long history of policies that have prevented development of new, denser, and more cost-effective homes. But if we want more equitable and resilient communities, we need to quit funding approaches that compel economic and racial segregation. If we do this right this time, though, we have a real chance to use the economic recovery to build housing stability and household wealth for everyone in our community. So let me move away from research and talk about the actions that my company, Housing Partnership Equity Trust, and our partners have been taking to take on the larger challenge. We take one approach, preservation. We invest to maintain rental affordability in neighborhoods that have the necessary elements for household success. The Harvard study I mentioned earlier, the researchers found that there are five characteristics of communities that improve upward mobility. They have less segregation by income and race. They have lower levels of income inequality. They have better schools. They have lower rates of violent crime and a larger share of two parent households. So these are the communities that we target. And it's a challenge because you're trying to catch a property in a neighborhood at a point of inflection between the time when neglect and changing consumer demand had made the neighborhood relatively affordable and the point where a new demand, a new recognition of all the neighborhood has to offer makes the properties in that community unaffordable to a preservation buyer like us. We buy older properties, typically 80s vintage garden apartments and in entering suburbs that was targeted investment are generally class B properties. Our residents typically make 50 to 60% of their median income. And while many were essential workers through the pandemic, Others who work in hospitality and service jobs lost hours or lost their jobs altogether. A typical resident for us is a home health care aide, divorced with two children. In any ordinary year, if she has reasonable rent, a decent safe home, access to the bus line to work, good grocery stores and good schools nearby, her life works and her family thrives. This year though, she also needed a bigger hand up and our nonprofit partners provided that. We partner with strong nonprofit housing pro providers who know their markets and have decades of experience in serving vulnerable households. Our nonprofit partners often serve as the property manager for our investments. And this year, effective property management often looked more like social work case management than traditional property management. Our partners were surveying residents to understand their needs and then responding by getting pop-up food banks to come to the community, helping residents apply for rental assistance and other community benefits, tapping philanthropy to fill gaps, identifying resources for families who are forced to provide homeschooling, and developing payment plans for residents who needed them. Through the pandemic, physical occupancy remained very high while rent payments lagged later and later into the month. Our residents are smart folks and with the restrictions on um, late fees and um, penalties in place in most jurisdictions, our residents realized as many years probably did too, that they could get an interest-free loan from the first of the month to the 25th of the month. So they paid on the 25th, they were still current uh, and they had uh, more cash flow to deal with the risk and insecurity of the last year. 
Overall, our rent payment levels averaged about 90% from April of 2020 through March of this year, which is aligned with what the rest of our sector has been seeing. Our properties are what is typically called NOAA, naturally occurring affordable housing. So they're rental properties that don't benefit from deep ongoing public subsidies. So how do we make the math work between what it costs to acquire these properties, what our residents can pay, what it costs to maintain the properties and what investors need in uh, terms of a fair return? Well, first we have to be very, very disciplined about our numbers. We know we can't absorb the cost of overpaying by raising rents without changing our residents. So we can't. Um, in some jurisdictions, particularly California, we seek tax abatements. They're available for affordable housing providers, um, are available for affordable housing provided by nonprofit housing providers. We also often seek local subsidies in the form of uh, forgivable subordinate financing or energy upgrade financing. Um, and we always accept Section 8 rental vouchers from residents who have them. Uh, we create meaningful operating reserves when we acquire properties because, again, our residents can't afford to shoulder the cost of an unexpected expense and our investors fairly expect to get a reasonable and consistent return. So the properties we buy are often tired. They've experienced significant deferred maintenance when we take over. And when we survey the residents as part of the acquisition, the number one thing residents tell us that they want is they want to have their repair tickets responded to. No more waiting six months for a dripping faucet to be fixed. No more waiting a month for a working stove. Um, they need to be treated with respect. So our primary real estate focus is addressing the things that drive savings and make an economic uh, difference. We green up properties when we take over so that we can reduce energy and resource consumption. And we focus on the things that improve quality of life, keeping units in good working condition, and then fixing the things in the community that create good community centers. So you trade out that broken down tennis court instead for a dog park and a children's playground. So you have a worthwhile play to, place to gather. And then we really do focus on treating residents with dignity because some participants in this market segment use tenant abuse and property neglect as a business strategy. But our combined approach of modest rent growth and focused and respectful property management means that our turnover is well below the industry average of 50% a year. So we have savings in marketing and turnover costs. But in the lineup of policy concerns and considerations I discussed above, where does our approach fit in? Well, we're delivering affordable housing largely to residents of color, providing housing security and stability. We're assuring the residents have access to tools they need to succeed. But we still have to work through a complex array of public programs and requirements, even though our properties don't generally have deep subsidy. Most of the properties we acquire previously benefited from low income housing tax credits or from some other long gone subsidy programs. So the subsidies are no longer flowing, but the restrictions stay in place. We also accept housing choice vouchers in project based section eight, uh, which means we have to comply with federal requirements. This year, our nonprofit partners helped residents access emergency rental assistance that carry different requirements. In each of the light subsidies that we access from tax abatements to lower cost subordinate financing carry their own distinct additional restrictions. If we seek to sever excess land and make that available for development, we face all the local zoning and permitting requirements. And of course, the properties are subject to all the ordinary rules governing rental apartments in any community. Then we have the requirements from our investors, CRA motivated bank investors that need use restrictions for their regulators. The foundations who made program related investments with us need our investments to meet their tax exemption rules. And because we are REIT, we're subject to the tax and compliance regimes applicable to all the REITs. Most of these rules are designed, I believe, with good intent to address very particular and meaningful problems. But the cost of compliance is daunting and it reduces the amount of funds available to meet the needs of the residents we serve. 
And for me personally, there may be some karma at work. I'm a former HUD official and former Fannie Mae executive. So I may be paying for my earlier hubris about the value that I thought in balance the rules I imposed brought. So to circle back to the beginning, we know that good affordable housing changes lives and strengthens our communities. As we navigate through this year and beyond the pandemic, we know that affordable housing shortages may be one of the largest obstacles to economic growth. We also know there isn't a one size fits all solution to the housing crisis we're facing and there doesn't need to be. But there is one thing that we all need to do and that is for us to make a commitment, all of us, uh, to fight for housing that supports inclusive growth, resilience and well-being for our communities, for our neighbors and ourselves. With that, we really can get the recovery that I think we deserve. So thank you, I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you so much, Anne. And we do have a number of questions uh, that I'm going to share with you. Uh, but before we do that, I do want to again um, uh, thank uh, Larry Ackman for uh, you know his gift uh, to Shack, which supports uh, you know this uh, speaker series uh, and, and to participants uh, this evening, whether you're uh, watching uh, via our live Facebook or YouTube feeds or uh, part of the uh, or, or dialed into Zoom. Um, you know, the, the, the Ackman Lecture is the most public facing and visible uh, feature of uh, a larger set of programs that are supported by, uh, by, by Larry's gift. Uh, the questions around how we make uh, right uh, decisions and ethical decision making in the real estate industry really uh, permeate uh, our curriculum and uh, the work that we've done uh, to develop programming. Uh, we really owe a great deal of, of gratitude to, uh, to Larry Ackman. Um, the, the, the first question I've got for you, Anne, uh, some folks have shared them in the QA, some have uh, sent them to me directly. Um, you mentioned that you had a payment rate of about 90%. Uh, I know that early in the pandemic, uh, you know, there were very real concerns. Uh, you, know, you mentioned Joint Center for Housing Studies at Harvard, uh, you know, Urban Institute, Brookings, Shack, uh, with regard to the potential for mass evictions. How were you able to maintain such a high payment rate and, and how are you able to keep so many people in their homes? Uh, let me tell you, last March as the pandemic uh, took hold, we ran numbers and we're like, well, what if we get 20% less rent payments? What if we get 50% less rent payments? Because we know who we serve and we know how vulnerable they are. Uh, so we started building contingency plans. And the first thing we did, like everybody else in real estate, is we just stopped all discretionary spending. Anything that didn't have to be done did not happen. Uh, and we focused on the things that made property safer and more secure through the pandemic. And then our uh, nonprofit partners and our property managers really did examine closely the residents in each community and looked at where they were individually. And it really became a household by household thing because some households were working more hours, delivery truck drivers working around the clock, but then they had childcare issues. Uh, so property managers helped identify those resources for people who had lost their jobs. Um, we started tapping philanthropy. We looked for every form of soft, uh, of local rental assistance. And as you know, there was a patchwork of resources available uh, that didn't quite add up. And it, but our uh, nonprofit partners were really diligent and couldn't have been more dogged in looking to see every possible resource that we had available. So that as a result, uh, while we do have big operating reserves, we didn't have to tap our reserves. None of our properties required uh, forbearance. Uh, we do have expect to, you know, we've got deferred maintenance. So this year we're going to be spending a lot more of CapEx uh, as uh, the pandemic uh, uh, continues, uh, but, but it was that intense focus on making sure that the residents were safe and taking care of, I think made a big difference. And it also meant that when residents were making choices about whether or not to pay rent, because we weren't evicting people, we couldn't and, and we weren't going to, um, they made their housing a priority because their housing was important. I think one of the pieces from the Joint Center of Housing Studies, I, I wish I had coined the term myself, but it was called housing eats first. 
um, and it captures a couple of things. As you describe, people really prioritizing their rent payments, especially at a time where you really had nowhere else to go. You had to be in your home. Uh, but uh, in, in the reference to you know, eats first, really also capturing that people are having to make some very, very tough choices in trading off across uh, you know, a set of expenses that you know, all of which are essential, uh, you know, food, healthcare, clothing, education. Um, so uh, another link I'm going to share um, in the chat right now is to HPT's uh, 2020 annual report. So as you want to learn more about you know, the work of the team over the last year, there's also a link on their website to uh, you know, th those various partner institutions uh, that Anne mentioned. Um, and you saw the link that you know, uh, in addition to your know, work with the GSEs and HUD, uh, I was uh, so thrilled. Uh, you know, everyone at the National Housing Conference uh, you know, is uh, you know, Truly, we're, we're all very lucky. Uh, I'm not part of the organization myself, but the, the organization itself is very lucky uh, that Anne agreed to, to, to serve as chair uh, when she was elected uh, last summer. Uh, Professor uh, Barry Hirsch, who heads up uh, Shaq's uh, Master of Science in Real Estate Development Program, is asking about uh, reductions in zoning restrictions, innovations in construction technology, and how that's um, impacting your business model. Um you know, these are great things, I got to tell you. Um, reduction in zoning restrictions absolutely can enable us to build more housing where we need it um, and at a cost that makes sense. Uh, and new construction technology is making a huge difference. Uh, modular construction in the apartment industry uh, is particularly impactful when we're seeing all sorts of um, we're really struggling with having enough construction workers to deliver the uh, amount and the quality of housing that we need. Um, and with different changes in communities, being able to reduce, uh, to, to bring a, a property to completion through modular construction and panelized construction uh, really helps. And also a lot of the prop tech work that's being done to sequence uh, the steps of housing, uh, both in single family construction and in multifamily construction is reducing the total amount of time it takes to produce housing and uh, helping us improve the quality. So the, the next question comes from Ed Robertson, one of our graduate students. Um, uh, he, he's asking about ESG uh, disclosures and the role that you know, uh, greater uh, the, you know, greater attention to ESG uh, is playing and driving the business. I know it's you know something that's you know critically important for you and your team. How has it changed in the last uh, couple of years, uh, not only for uh, for, for your team uh, but for uh, the, the multifamily housing sector overall? I think the sector overall has realized that we have to be able to report and report in consistent ways about the impact that we're having. Um, one, to hold ourselves accountable. Uh, you don't want to just talk big. You want to show that you're actually delivering. But if we're going to continue to attract investors who care about making an impact with their dollars, they need to have the, the data uh, that shows what they're getting for their money. Uh, so uh, a, a lot more folks are measuring and reporting on their ESG impact. We've uh, released an ESG report for two years now um, and are continuing to refine you know, what metrics make the most difference to investors and what are most relevant to the work we do. But uh, it's, it's a good thing. Yeah, and folks do take a look. You can find that ESG report on, on the website as well. Aaron, we have a couple more questions. Um, uh, Aaron is asking uh, about whether or not with so many um, well-intentioned folks in the market, uh, tr uh, you know, working uh, independently to you know advance you know the, the the housing mission and ensure that you know every American family um, you know has access to housing opportunity and again all of the amenities and opportunities that come along with housing choice. Um, what coordination do you see in the market? Are there opportunities to improve coordination uh, amongst you know firms, amongst public agencies at the local and you know the federal level? Sure. Uh, and thanks for asking that because you're playing uh, to who I am. I'm a compulsive joiner. I'm, I like to gather together with other people who are wrestling with the same problems and learn from each other, share what worked for me, what was a complete disaster, get solutions that I can't figure out. Uh, so 
you know, in both every community and at the national level, there's some great groups, right? So for me, my go-tos are the National Housing Conference, NARI, ULI, NAL, um, uh, National Low Income Housing Coalition, but then at the local level. I'm, a, I'm active in the Federal City Council in Washington, D.C. I'm active in the Economic Club. I'm active in the Alliance housing solutions so that we all come together really regularly and try to solve problems collectively and share what we've learned. Uh, but I also think that we owe each other uh, a regular review of whether or not we need each of us and whether or not we should be merging or combining or finding ways to uh, divide up our work in different ways so we're more efficient. Uh, and uh, I've certainly learned from a number of other industry participants um, about the greater impact they've had when they've been able to create mergers and strategic alliances with other housers um, so that we can do more of what we want to do. Yeah, and, and the, the list of organizations and, uh, that, that you mentioned and opportunities for folks to get involved, uh, I'd, I'd be remiss if I did not mention right here at NYU for folks that are, you know, in the city or affiliated with the institution, the Furman Center uh, at, uh, at Wagner is just uh, an exceptional place with some truly wonderful people. Uh, we also have the, you know, the Urban Lab headed by uh, Matt Quatnitz uh, at, at the Shack Institute. So please take advantage of the opportunity to get involved. It does segue into the next question. Um, uh, one of our uh, participants is asking, you know, as an individual participant, uh, as an individual citizen, an, an economic actor, uh, you know, what are ways that I can help to create more affordable housing opportunity? Well, let's start with talking to your elected officials. Because again, we have rules for our built environment that aren't meeting our needs. And um, those are rules we're imposing on ourselves. Uh, and we're gonna continue to impose those on ourselves unless each of us goes to our elected officials and says, mm -mm, it's not working. Uh, we need to be more thoughtful. We need to change our uh, housing construct so that we can build more affordably and build communities that are more resilient. Um, that's the first thing you got to do. Yeah. So and, at the and other extreme, center, sorry, go I ahead. Gotta, uh, I got to say about the firm center, if you don't get their daily, uh, uh, if you're not on their daily listserv, you got to, because there's always great research coming up uh, that I turn to every day. Uh, absolutely. I can't say enough uh, great stuff about the Furman Center. Uh, one last question for you. So that was, uh, you know, on the individual side, uh, move to the other extreme at the federal level. What are the policy priorities that we might see that will help to advance, you know, whether it's workforce, affordable, NOAA, you know, what are the policy priorities that uh, we might see from the current administration that will really help to advance the agenda? <laughs> I couldn't be more excited about the focus on housing as infrastructure and the commitment to actually spending money in, in three areas I care particularly about. Uh, revitalizing public housing. Uh, we can't let our public housing continue to decline. Delivering resources to under-resourced communities so as to increase home ownership, particularly in communities of color. That's critical. Uh, and delivering more housing support directly to families. That's huge. Um, continuing examination of the Community Reinvestment Act, uh, which is critical to attracting uh, bank capital into all our communities in ways that make sense for where we are today is important. Uh, and I've certainly been following closely with the work that the uh, Federal Reserve and the OCC have been doing in that space. And thank you so much for joining us again. We are so appreciative of everything that you do for SHAC and in support of our students and program and for you know, everyone looking for housing opportunity in, in the United States. Thank you, really appreciate being here. And thanks again to, to Larry Ackman. Uh, the, the, the Ackman Lecture um, is uh, the most public facing of a larger set of programs supported by uh, Larry's gift uh, that enable us to bring you know, questions around ethics and ethical decision-making in real estate uh, to uh, our program at the Shack Institute. Uh, so uh, thanks to everyone for joining us. Please do join us again next week for that 
question mark Green New Deal uh, program hosted by the NYU Urban Lab at the Shack Institute. And then of course our third annual Pride Roundtable for LGBTQ students, professionals uh, and allies uh, next Tuesday evening. And thank you again, have a wonderful evening. Folks, we'll see you again soon. Take care.